to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Let all things be done decently and in order. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. We welcome you today to our study of the Lord's Church as we're going to be thinking today on the subject of church order. That is that all things are done according to the Bible and in a decently and orderly fashion as God tells us. And so we're so happy that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Uh, we want you to know that thrills us to know that you're studying along with us as we're going to be looking to the Word of God together. And friend, if you don't have your Bible handy, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it ready as we're going to use it in our study today. We also want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. Look up the local congregation of the Church of Christ in your area. We'd love for you to visit them. They'd love for you to visit on Sunday or on Wednesday. And if you'd like to learn more about the Word of God, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in any way we can in your soul's spiritual state. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about your money. We're not concerned about those type of things. We want to help men and women go to heaven. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find all of our vast library of Bible study material free of charge. We have written material, videos, audio lessons, and it's all available 24-7 from our website. If you'd like to have a hard copy of today's lesson, whether that be on video or audio, you can log on to our website and fill out a media request form, and we'll be happy to send that material to you free of charge. And as always, friend, our hope and prayer is that each of us will let God and His Word be the final authority on all matters. Today we're going to be thinking about, as it relates to the Lord's church, church order meaning that we do things, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, in a decent and orderly fashion. As we think about this, let's remember what the church is. Friend, when we talk about church order, what is the church is one of the first questions we've got to ask. And friend, the church in the Bible is the people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, Paul said, You are the body of Christ. Two Christians, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. God is not dwelling in temples made with hands, Acts 7 verse 48 through 50. And so when we think of a building, that's not what we're talking about. The church is the people. God and creation are always in the Bible composed of order. Genesis chapter 1, God would make something and then it would be in an orderly fashion and it would say God saw that it was good. And there is such great order to God's creation everywhere. The, the, the earth and the firmament show the handiwork of God. You can look at the human body. You can look at nature. You can look at the, the stars and the constellations. And there is such intricate, detailed order emphasizing again that God's a God of order. And as His people, the church, to please God, we must excel in doing things the right way. I want to remind you again of why we're mentioning this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, Paul said, Let all things be done decently and in order. The backdrop of that statement in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40 is this. Things were not being done decently and in order 
in Corinth, in the church at Corinth. There were people who were not waiting on others to take the Lord's Supper. There were people who may have had various miraculous gifts and they would just get up and blurt those out without an interpreter there or without uh, realizing if that would help anyone else. There were those who weren't emphasizing love. There was chaos and confusion and problems in the church at Corinth. And thus Paul would say, you're to do all things decently and in order. And so in our lesson today, we want to make application to the church of the Lord today and ask, how can we have church order in our lives as well? And friend, we want to mention three ways. First, church order must be emphasized in my life as a Christian. That is, as a member of the Lord's body, I want to live a life that's decently lived and in order. You see, the Bible teaches, I must live for Jesus Christ each and every day of my life. Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Friend, when we think about priorities, what is it that really is most important? My eternal soul is the most valuable thing I have. Jesus asked two questions in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. What will it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Our soul is the most valuable thing we have, and we want to live our lives in such a way that we're living for Jesus each and every day. You know, that's really what it's all about. Living for Christ and living for God every day, right? What, what's the sum total of, if you boil it down, What's life really about? Look in your Bible, if you would, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I want you to notice verse number 13. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I want you to look at what the Bible says about the, the purpose and the meaning of life and what it's really all about. Solomon sought for meaning in life, and he finally came to a conclusion in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. As a Christian, I want to make sure that my life is being lived for the Lord, that I'm living an orderly and decent life, and that that life is going to bring honor and glory to God, which is my whole duty. Secondly, as I think about living my life in an orderly fashion, friend, that means that I've got to abstain from certain immoral, ungodly things of this world. We can't have the best of... You can't live it up and live in sin and have all the fun you want and live for God. Those two are incompatible. James 4, verse 4, James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with God is enmity, or friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. Ephesians 5 verse 11, we're not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And we can see how people got in a bad spot in the Bible by getting involved in the wrong things. Paul would say of Demas in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10 following, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Balaam, who at one time said, I'll neither turn from the right hand or to the left. Just a few chapters later, he died in battle against the people of God. Come out from among them, God says, and be ye separate, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. And so when we're trying to emphasize living an orderly life by abstaining from evil... Friend, you can see how a man could so easily get caught up in that. I'll give you one example. Mark chapter 10. We have the story of the rich young ruler. This man came to Jesus and, Good teacher, we know that you're a man from God. No one can do the things you do unless God sends it. Like with Nicodemus, he wants to know, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Mark chapter 10. Jesus tells him, Keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. All these things I've done from my childhood. Then Jesus said this. One thing you lack. Sell what you have. 
Give to the poor and come follow me and you'll have joy in heaven. You know what the Bible says? That man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. We need to make sure and abstain from getting caught up in, getting, letting the world get its tentacles in us to the point that we can't put God first and really live for Him. And then, friend, as we think about order in my life, I've got to see sin as God sees it. If I'm going to live a decent and orderly life, then, friend, I've got to be disgusted by and see sin as God Himself sees it. You see, God sees sin as a wedge between him and man. It's what separates us from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. God sees sin as that which brings spiritual death. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Our God sees sin as a burden that is too heavy to bear. Psalm 38, verse 4. And friend, God sees sin as causing spiritual devastation. The wages of sin is death. We've got to realize sin. Here's what I want you to see. I want you to see how God describes the life of sin. It, the life of sin, you know, here's how the world portrays it. The world portrays sin as fun, as exciting, as luxurious, as you're going to be living on top of the world and have every pleasure. You're going to be happy and popular and life's just going to be going great. Friend, that's a lie. And the Bible tells us that. Look in your Bible, if you would, in Proverbs chapter 13. And I want you to notice what the Scripture says in Proverbs chapter 13. Look at verse number 15. How does God see sin and how must I see it to have proper order in my life? Proverbs 13 verse 15. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful or the way of the sinner is hard. How's the life of sin looked at from the Scripture? It's the hardest, most discouraging, depressing type of life you could ever live. Someone says, okay, well prove it. Luke 15. The uh, prodigal son thought he was going to live it up. He took his father's inheritance early. He was living it up with all his friends. He was partying, we might say, having a good time until all that money ran out. And where did he find himself? in the hog pen, eating slop. What's a life of sin like? It is not a decent and orderly life. It is a disgusting, depressing type of life. And friend, we want to emphasize for my life to have order, I must live according to the teaching of the Bible. Then secondly, as we think about uh, church order, not only must my life be lived orderly, but for church order to exist, we must have order in our source and use of God's authority. Let's realize that the Bible teaches God and His Son have all authority. You see, I didn't create God. God created me. Genesis 1 verse 1, God said, let us make man, or, or the Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God made all things. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God made man. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God, breathed, God created man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I am a creation of Almighty God. And friend, I need to realize God, as God's creation, God and His Son have all authority over me. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is the head of the church and that I am under His headship as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, as we think about this idea, living our lives orderly and decently under God's authority, a natural question then arises. Where am I going to find that authority from God today? And friend, the good news is the Bible God's Word is where we seek and where we find God's authority. In Jeremiah 37, verse 17, an evil king asked a great question. Is there any word from the Lord? And friend, that, the answer is a resounding yes. John 2, verse 5, the mother of Jesus put it so clearly when she said to the servants, whatever He says to you, 
do it. Friend, we need to look to the Word of God to find what Jesus wants us to do today. It has everything we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, All Scripture is inspired of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17, It contains all truth, John 17 verse 17, and that truth will make us free. And thus we must do exactly what God says in the Bible to be right with Him. Now, friend, let me make one last point of emphasis here as we talk about church order relating to our authority. God has all authority in matters of, of doctrine and salvation, but we also need to realize God has delegated authority in the local congregation on matters of option and expediency to the eldership. Elders in the local congregation are given authority by God. Now, I want you to look in your Bible and look in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you as it relates to the congregation that one may be a member of. The elders in that congregation in matters of expediency, how we're going to evangelize, how we're going to edify, how we're going to teach the Word of God to other people as far as the, the ways that we may use to reach our community effectively. An eldership does have God-given authority in that area. And here's the point. If I'm going to live a decent and orderly life, my responsibility is to obey and to submit. Not to question, not to criticize, not to be always be a naysayer, but to, even though it may not be the exact way I think it ought to not be done. I want to be decent and order, go along with as best as can, as long as it doesn't violate the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we've seen two ways. We can have order by having order in my life, by having order as it relates to the authority of God. Now let's notice a third. What does church order mean? It means that we have order in our doctrine. That is that our doctrine is decent according to the Word of God and orderly meaning that it follows the teaching of the Bible. You know, order in doctrine naturally demands unity in doctrine. You can't have order if everybody out there is teaching something different. That's not order. That's chaos and confusion. Order naturally means unity. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, Paul said that in the New Testament, by following God's pattern, that the same thing would be taught in every church. 1 Corinthians 4 17. It means that we want to strive to have the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4 verse 3. And we do that by having one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one Spirit, the seven ones. Ephesians 4 verse 4. Friend, let's realize we've, that's something we've got to strive for. If we're going to have unity in doctrine and order, we've got to work at that. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, verse number 1. Acts 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. They, they had things together and in common, and they worked as a common unit, striving to do God's will. You know, order in our doctrine then naturally means that we have a unified voice when we stand up against and speak out against false doctrine. Jude 3 commands that, that we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We're not to have fellowship. We can't be in having an orderly life in doctrine. We're not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. If I'm in fellowship with false teaching... And friend, I don't have the order God wants. Now, I know sometimes people say, that's really not being like Jesus, is it? That's really not following the Savior. And my friend, that's where we forget what the Savior said to the Sadducees in Mark 12, verse 24. Jesus said, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, 
nor the power of God. Jesus said, you're wrong because you don't know the Bible and you don't know God. And he defended against their error about the resurrection. Friend, when we think about having unity in doctrine, let's make some specific application to those doctrines and notice how that applies to the teaching of the New Testament. For example, order in doctrine means that we are going to teach very clearly as it relates to salvation what God teaches, that baptism is for the remission of sins and that it saves. There's a lot of people today who will say things like this. They'll say, baptism, it's good to do, and it's something you ought to do after you're saved, but it's not essential to salvation. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Baptism doesn't save. I've talked to people who specifically said that. Well, oh, friend, I want you to see in your Bible what God says on this subject. Would you open with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, Verse number 21, did you know the Bible says baptism saves? Not because baptism died for us, but because that's where we contact the blood of Jesus. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3 with me, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 21. Peter says this, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friend, listen carefully. The Bible said, if the Bible says baptism does now also save us, why would anyone dare say anything different? Are we having proper order in our doctrine if we say baptism doesn't save when the Bible says baptism saves us? Jesus said the same thing. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, why does baptism save? Well, friend, because that's where we contact the blood of Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. As many of us as were baptized into Christ, listen now, were baptized into His death. Does Jesus save? Does His death save? Does His blood save? Absolutely. Hebrews 9, verse 22 through 27 clearly teaches that. When does a person contact that saving death and blood of Jesus? At the point he is baptized for the remission of his sins. You see, Galatians 3.27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Friend, let's also mention another idea as it relates to having order in our doctrine, and it's this. We've got to teach what the Bible says about worship, and especially as it relates to singing as an act of worship. Where in the New Testament do we find authority for mechanical instruments of music? Where do you find a piano or a guitar or a set of drums or an organ being used in music by the church in the New Testament? Well, friend, you don't. It's just not in there. In fact, God tells us exactly what He wants. I want you to look at two passages with me. Would you look in Colossians 3.16, and then we're going to flip over to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19. Let's look at these two verses together. Notice what God says about singing in Colossians chapter 3. I want you to look at verse number 16. The Word of God records this as it relates to singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now back up to Ephesians 5, verse number 19. The Bible says Christians are to be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, as we study the New Testament, we find Christians singing with their voice on every occasion. Matthew 26, verse 30, Jesus and His disciples sang a hymn and they went out. Is anyone happy? 
Let him sing psalms, James 5, verses 13 through 15. I will sing praises of you in the assembly, Ephesians 2, verse 14 and 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I'll pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit and I'll sing with the understanding. Every example that we have of the New Testament church worshiping God as it related to music was singing with the voice. No mechanical instruments were ever used that we know of in the New Testament. And so here's what we do know. We're not to go beyond what's written. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. We're not to add to nor take away from the Word of God. And thus, if we're going to have proper church order in our doctrine and in our teaching, well, friend, that doctrine needs to be according to what God wants. God wants us to worship Him in an orderly fashion as He's prescribed. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I've got to put my whole heart, soul, mind, and body into my worship, but it's got to be according to truth as well. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 10, 29 and Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 31. And friend, as we think practically about this, much of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40 applies directly to chaos that was going on in the worship at Corinth. When Paul said, let all things be done decently and in order, when people weren't waiting on each other for the Lord's Supper, when somebody might have a, uh, something come, a revelation from God and just stand up and shout it out, or somebody might jump up and speak in an unknown tongue, there was so much chaos and confusion that their worship was not decently and in order. And so we want our life. We want our authority and we want our doctrine and our worship to be in a way that pleases God by following what the Bible teaches. Friend, we ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? We want you to know this. The God of heaven loves you deeply, more than anything in all the world. He wants you to be saved. God wants all men to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. He wants that so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for me and you. John 3, verse 16. Have you heard the message about Jesus? Do you believe He's the Savior of the world? Would you repent of sin? Luke 13, 3. Would you confess His beautiful name before men? And to have every sin washed away, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, verse 38. And rising out of that watery grave, Romans 6, verse 4, will you walk in newness of life? and live a life that's decently and in order in God's sight. We hope and pray you'll join us next time as we study more together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.